Last week, after the Lakers and Pelicans faced off at the Staples Center in Los Angeles, I came on this podcast and I spoke about the emerging rivalry between New Orleans and the Lakers, between Zion Williamson and LeBron James. Two organizations, two players who will forever be linked together because of everything that's happened in the past couple of years. And when I say rivalry, I'm not talking about these two guys disliking each other. This isn't like the Pistons Bulls in the late 80s, early 90s, where those two teams seriously hated each other. But there is a real competitive rivalry developing between the Pelicans and the Lakers, between LeBron James and Zion Williamson. If you needed proof of what I'm saying is true, you got that proof Sunday night. Saturday night, the Lakers were in Memphis to play Ja Morant and the Grizzlies. It was as uninspiring a performance by Los Angeles as I've seen all season. LeBron James had just 19 points. Anthony Davis, only 15 points. The Lakers were down 12 at halftime. They were down 20 points going into the fourth quarter. Ended up losing the game by 17. LeBron looked uninterested most of the game. The whole team did. There are conspiracy theories going around that the Lakers tanked their game against Memphis because they don't want to see the Pelicans in a seven-game series in the playoffs. LeBron James's performance Sunday night against New Orleans only added fuel to that fire. He was nothing short of brilliant Sunday night in New Orleans. He was playing that game like it was Game 7 of the NBA Finals. It was a playoff atmosphere in the Smoothie King Center. The crowd was electric the entire game. And LeBron James was at his best. He once again rose to the occasion carried the Lakers to a win while Anthony Davis was sitting out with knee soreness. He had that 40-foot, three-point shot to close out the first half that completely shifted the momentum of the game going into halftime. He was brilliant in the fourth quarter, led the Lakers to a 10-point differential behind his 13 points, finished the game with a triple-double, 34 points, 12 rebounds, 13 assists. Like Tuesday night, LeBron James, I feel like, was sending a message to Zion Williamson with his performance. Zion is the first guy in LeBron's 17-year career that has received as much, if not more, media coverage and fanfare than LeBron James. The message was clear. This is still LeBron's league. He's not ready to hand over the leader of the NBA reigns to Zion Williamson just yet. Some of my fellow Pelicans fans on Twitter Sunday night, in my opinion, were overreacting to this loss to the Lakers. It was a a troubling loss. There's no doubt about it. There was no reason the Pelicans shouldn't have won this game, besides the fact that LeBron completely took over. But this is the difference between a veteran team and a young team. We saw it clearly Sunday night. This young Pelicans team doesn't know how to win yet. They don't know how to close out games in the fourth quarter. They haven't really developed their identity. Who's the guy that's going to be our go-to guy when the game's on the line? Zion Williamson didn't touch the ball the last three minutes of the game. That is absolutely inexcusable, and it falls on the shoulders of Alvin Gentry. Your best player, the guy who scored 35 points on 12 of 16 shooting, doesn't touch the fucking ball in the final three minutes. Instead, Alvin Gentry decided that he was going to rely on Brandon Ingram and Drew Holiday in the closing moments of that game. B.I. was having the worst game of the season, which has happened coincidentally each time that he's played the Lakers. And this game proved what I've been saying for the past month or so. David Griffin has got to trade Drew Holiday this offseason. Both Drew Holiday and Brandon Ingram were god-awful Sunday night. But I can give Ingram a pass. Just a bad game. But Drew Holiday is making $28 million a year. He's the supposed leader of this team, if you listen to David Griffin and Alvin Gentry. And once again, 
In a big game situation, Drew Holiday was a non-factor. 11 points in 38 minutes. He was dominated by LeBron several times. Holiday's one of the best defenders in the NBA. But it's obvious that he cannot guard LeBron James. Very few, if anybody, can. That's not his fault. He shouldn't be fucking guarding LeBron anyway. That's on Alvin Gentry. I'm calling out Drew Holiday, though, because this isn't the first time he's failed to show up in a big game. Every game right now is a must-win for New Orleans. There's only 23 games left. You're three games behind Memphis for the number eight seed. Your best players have to show up, especially in these big games. And Drew Holiday's not showing up when it counts. Oh, he was great Friday night against Cleveland, one of the worst teams in the league. He was great against Golden State, great against Portland. Yet it seems when the Pelicans are going up against playoff caliber opponents, Drew Holiday's nowhere to be found. He had a plus-minus of minus seven Sunday night against the Lakers. Last Tuesday against the Lakers, another stinker. Another 11-point performance in 38 minutes. Shot 26% from the field. February 13th against Oklahoma City. 14 points, plus-minus of minus five. February 4th against Milwaukee. Seven fucking points on 21% shooting. Plus-minus of minus 18. February 2nd against the Rockets, 11 points on 35%, plus minus a minus two. Are you starting to get the picture? New Orleans is paying $28 million for Drew Holiday to shrink when his team needs him the most. It pains me to say this about Drew Holiday because he's been so loyal to New Orleans. He could have joined Anthony Davis last year, demanded to be traded, but he wanted to stay in New Orleans but he no longer fits this team. When he's running the point, iso ball takes over and the Pelicans' offense becomes stagnant. As I said earlier, some of my fellow Pelicans fans on Twitter were irate over this loss, rightfully so, but this is the pain you go through when you have a young team. Take Zion Williamson, for instance. As great as he was against the Lakers Sunday night, he was equally as bad with the turnovers. He turned the ball over six times, most of those times in the paint. Damn near every time Zion got the ball in the paint, the Lakers collapsed him with double teams. He's got to learn in those situations to kick the ball out to the open guy. Most times he had B.I. or Lonzo wide open for a three. I also see a lot of talk on Twitter of people wanting to trade some of these veteran players. Trade J.J. Reddit. Trade Derek Favors. Trade Drew Holiday. I agree with the trading Drew Holiday. But New Orleans needs both Reddick and Favors in this locker room. They've got to have guys on this roster that can teach these young players how to win. Both Reddick and Favors have extensive playoff experience. J.J. Reddick has been to the playoffs every year of his career. He's played in 110 playoff games. Four different teams. He knows what it takes to win. Not to mention the fact that at 35 years old, he's still one of the best three-point shooters in the league. Pelicans fans just need to relax. They're heading in the right direction. Things could be much worse. People tend to forget how great this situation really is for New Orleans. How many times does a team lose a franchise player and contend for the playoffs the very next year? Better yet, How many times does a team lose a franchise player and in return get a great young core of three guys who could be here for years to come and another franchise player in the draft? Hardly ever. It does not happen in the NBA. This is rare. Dwight Howard forced his way out of Orlando in 2012. It took the Orlando Magic six years to make it back to the playoffs. They haven't had a superstar on that roster since Dwight Howard left. Look what happened to Cleveland both times that LeBron James has left. They haven't made the playoffs since. I understand the frustration from some of the Pelicans fans, but let's just relax a minute. This franchise is in great shape. The future's bright. They're headed in the right direction. 
One other thing before we move on. While I was watching the game, I began to wonder what Anthony Davis could have been thinking. AD spent seven years in New Orleans, and I can't remember, but maybe a handful of times during the regular season, that there was a playoff-type atmosphere in the Smoothie King Center. The Pelicans struggled to sell tickets in the AD era, even though he was supposedly a superstar, a franchise player. During his last couple of years in New Orleans, he was constantly whining about not receiving enough attention nationally because the Pelicans didn't have any nationally televised games. Yet Zion Williamson arrives. Immediately, 12,000 season tickets are sold. Games are selling out in New Orleans. The city is falling in love with this team, something that never happened in the Anthony Davis era. The national media covers the Pelicans almost as much as they cover LeBron James and the Lakers. This week alone, New Orleans will be on national TV three times. Every fucking game the Pelicans play this week will be nationally televised. While Anthony Davis was here, they were lucky to get three nationally televised games in a fucking year. Not only is this proof that you can be a superstar player in a small market and get national media attention, but it's also proof that AD's not the superstar that he thinks he is. Zion is a number one on a team, a superstar. Anthony Davis is a number two. In 14 games, Zion Williamson has accomplished something that AD couldn't accomplish in seven years in New Orleans. Zion Williamson has made the New Orleans Pelicans relevant. All right, let's get to the Philadelphia 76ers. This season has been a disaster for Philadelphia. That's an odd thing to say about a team that's 37 and 24 sitting as the fifth seed in the Eastern Conference. But this is not a good basketball team. The Sixers, to me, are a team struggling to figure out their identity. After being a top 10 offense the past couple of years, Philadelphia right now is one of the worst offensive teams in the NBA. There isn't a team in the league that needs home court advantage in the playoffs more than the Philadelphia 76ers. They're one of the worst road teams in the NBA. Damn sure the worst road team of all the playoff caliber teams. They're 28-2 at home. They are 9-22 and on the road. Teams without an identity struggle to win games on the road. It seems like every month there's a story coming out of the Sixers locker room, and it's never good. Back in December, Al Horford was complaining about his, about his usage or lack thereof. Blame Coach Brett Brown for pretty much not utilizing him correctly. Al Horford's having one of the worst years of his career. And he hasn't helped his case much lately. Since he's been starting in place of the injured Joel Embiid, he's averaging just 11 points a game. Then you had general manager Elton Brand trade for Glenn Robinson III at the trade deadline. He's made one hell of an impact in Philadelphia by playing some of the worst basketball of anyone on this team. Since he arrived in Philadelphia, he's made exactly zero three-pointers scored a total of 26 points in eight games. Since the All-Star break, he's averaging 4.3 points a game. Hell of a pickup by Elton Brand. Just what the team needed. Another whiner who feels that he's underutilized. Robinson blames his terrible stats on not being told by Brett Brown what his role on this team is. I'll briefly explain it to him. Your role is to put the ball in the basket. That's what you do. Last week, after a soul-crushing loss to one of the worst teams in the league, the Cleveland Cavaliers, a team that's won 17 games this season, Josh Richardson told the media that this Philadelphia 76ers team lacks heart. Look at the bright side. At least someone on this roster finally said something that makes sense. Then you have all the controversy surrounding their two young superstar players, Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. Rumors that there is a bit of jealousy brewing between the two of them. Rumors that both guys want to be known more as celebrities than superstar basketball players. Speculation that this offseason, the Sixers front office is going to make a decision on whether or not they should split these two guys up. 
and who they should build their future around. Amidst all the locker room fighting and diva-like behavior from this team, one guy is taking advantage and a star could be in the making. Philadelphia guard Shake Milton has been on an absolute tear since Ben Simmons has been out with injury. 17 points against Milwaukee, 19 against the Knicks. Then he exploded Sunday against the Clippers for 39 points. He was the reason this depleted Philadelphia roster had a chance to end their seven-game road losing streak, which is now at eight games. This is the type of player that the Sixers need right now. Guys on the court who actually, you know, want to play basketball. Now, it's too early to anoint Shake Milton the Sixers' savior or the next Steph Curry, even though he did tie an NBA record Sunday for most consecutive three-pointers made. But if he continues to play at a high level, does it make the decision on who the Sixers should keep easier this summer? I think so. I've never been a big fan of Ben Simmons. I'm not a fan of guards in a guard-driven league who can't shoot the basketball. Not only can Ben Simmons not shoot, he's afraid to shoot. Three years in the NBA, he has not improved his game. If anything, he's actually gotten worse in terms of his outside shooting. Like the Houston Rockets, who we'll talk about in a second, the Philadelphia 76ers are another team that could be looking to make drastic changes this offseason. This current roster has zero chemistry. You have one of the better offensive big men in the NBA, and your offense is god-awful because you have a point guard who is not a threat to shoot the ball. You have two guys in Simmons and Embiid that don't play well together. Elton Brand has assembled a team that lacks leadership and has no identity. The Sixers have first-round playoff exit written all over them. All right, let's get to the Houston Rockets. I've seen a lot of talk lately about how the Rockets and their small ball lineup, how they've exploded since trading Clint Capella, Russell Westbrook playing some of the best basketball of his career, and how... The Rockets should be one of the favorites to win the Western Conference. Houston's won six straight, including one of the best games of the regular season Saturday night in Boston. They're seven and two since going to the small ball lineup, one and a half games out of the number two seed in the West. Yet, my opinion of this team has not changed. Once the playoffs begin, I don't like the Rockets' chances. I've talked about this several times on this podcast, but it bears repeating since everyone is falling in love with this Houston Rockets team. This small ball lineup is not going to work. I keep seeing people make comparisons with the Houston Rockets and the death lineup that the Golden State Warriors used. But people tend to forget that Kevin Durant was part of that lineup and he's 6'10". Here's the thing. There have been teams in the NBA that have employed small ball lineups in the past, but they've used them situationally. I can't think of one team in this league that has went small for a full 48 minutes or half the season going into the playoffs. It's uncharted territory. Now, will it work? We're going to find out, but I have my doubts. Actually, I don't think it's going to work, like I said a second ago. I could see the Rockets getting bounced in the first round, depending on their matchup. It's true that the NBA is becoming a smaller league. It's become a guard-driven league. Gone are the days of guys like Shaquille O'Neal and Dwight Howard being able to dominate the landscape of the NBA. The stars in this league now are guys like Steph Curry, Kawhi Leonard, or a 6'6 Zion Williamson. But that doesn't mean that you don't need size on the court to win. At the end of the day, you need someone on the court that can defend the paint, that can get rebounds. I mentioned Derek Favors earlier when talking about the Pelicans and not wanting to trade him. One of the reasons I don't want the Pelicans to trade him is because he's a beast in the paint. He and Zion both crash the glass, get offensive rebounds, give the Pelicans second chances. The Houston Rockets don't have a starter that's over 6'7". Now granted, they are bigger at the other four positions, But like we talked about on Saturday, regular season success doesn't necessarily mean playoff success. The Western Conference is full of teams that have big men. The Lakers have Anthony Davis. 
Rudy Gobert is a force in Utah. You have Nikola Jokic in Denver. KP in Dallas. The Rockets are defenseless against these guys. Who do they have to guard them? Tyson Chandler? He's a shell of the player he once was. I think I've made this comparison before, but I'm going to go there again. Do you remember the Wildcat offense in the NFL? I think it was either back in 2006 or 2007. The Miami Dolphins implemented the Wildcat offense and it took the league by storm. Defenses were accustomed to defending against spread offenses. The Dolphins rode the Wildcat all the way to the playoffs, got bounced in the wildcard round. The next season, NFL defense has caught up to it. We didn't hear about the Wildcat offense anymore. Same thing with the Houston Rockets. This small ball lineup is working great right now in the middle of the regular season. Teams are not used to defending it. NBA teams don't get time to study film and practice much in the regular season. It's a grind. But once the playoffs begin and your opponent is focused solely on defending against you in the small ball lineup for seven games, the weakness of this Rockets team will be exposed. This was a Hail Mary by Daryl Morey and Mike D'Antoni to save their jobs. I'll give them credit. The Rockets are a fun team to watch. Ultimately, though, this team is going to get exposed in the postseason. And I think we're going to see big changes this offseason in Houston. James Harden is not getting any younger. He has accomplished every individual accomplishment that you can accomplish in the NBA. The one thing that he lacks for his legacy is an NBA title. It wouldn't surprise me if over the next year or so we see him request a trade because he's not going to win a title in Houston. The title window is closed. All right, that's all for today. I'll be back Friday morning. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Click the notification bell to receive all updates from the channel. Leave a comment in the section below. You can follow me on Twitter at KC underscore BTL84. I appreciate all the support from you guys. Have a good week and I will see you on Friday.